fallen a little behind on the channel for some of the book reviews that covered on my blog for the Sword and Laser Book Club. Well, time to get caught up a little with one of the hotter titles of the year that the book club and I have read, Rebecca Yaros's Fourth Wing. Fourth Wing is something of a fantasy action romance novel. The plot follows Violet Sorigal, a young woman in the Kingdom of Navarre who has several physical disabilities that limit what she can do due to, due to increased risk of injury. And by increased risk, I mean she has frequent broken bones due to fragility of her skeleton. She becomes a trainee dragon rider at the assistance of her mother, who is a major general in her, the military of Navarre, or I should say the military government of Navarre. This leads to her having to go through a gauntlet of intensive training programs meant to call any candidates too weak to hold up as dragon riders by killing those candidates who fail, combined with a highly toxic culture that incentivizes murdering rival dragon rider candidates. On top of all of this, she has to contend with the rival romantic attentions of her overly protective childhood friend, and alternatively, the leader of a or there's to say the son of the leader of a military uprising who, as punishment for his father's sins, has be ended up becoming a Dragon Rider candidate himself. And to put the icing on top of the cake, there's the issue of some secrets that the government that Violet is pledged to serve, the government her mother does serve, um, that could rock the foundations of their country and related particularly to those secrets and how they connect to, their, to Navarre's military clashes with their neighbors. Some of this works for me. I've read enough manga of various stripes, shown in and otherwise, to be familiar with the whole idea of a training regimen that you will either pass or will kill you. In classic examples, it came up in the Battle Tendency arc of Jojo's Bizarre Adventure. It came up in the lead up to the Soul Society arc of Bleach and in the literal first chapter of Saint Seiya. Considering that this training is meant to demonstrate that the trainees have the physical ability to stay on a dragon in a combat situation, while it's horrifically cruel, it makes sense for the training program of a fascist state that doesn't value human life. And to be clear, it's a fascist state the story is very critical of in multiple respects. Where the story doesn't work for me is the attendees of the academy are encouraged to murder their classmates who are rivals for bonding with dragons. This is aggravated by the fact that near as the book conveys, the military of this country is of Navarre is made up exclusively of dragon riders. There's no infantry to take the place of the dragon riders hold. The thing is, fascist states need meat for the grinder. While they will may have an elite military cadre that is upheld as a model over the others, such as the Dragon Rider in this book, they need to also have regular infantry in various forms to have by comparison to go out to fight and die in not-so-glorious battle for the state. Well, glorious in how the state portrays it, but not so glorious in how it actually pans out. Navarre in Fourth Wing doesn't have that. To be clear, the state in the book, Devar, is clearly written as a fascist state. There are militaristic expansions of power where political control of the state apparatus is more or less completely in control of the military. And the government is removing information from the literal history books that doesn't support an expansionist agenda pointed at their neighboring countries even to the point of destroying evidence of a past threat to the entire world that is at risk of returning and one that led to the main character to Navarre and their neighbors allying together to fight for the sake of all humanity in the past. I mean, honestly, that part act like makes complete and total sense. The decisions of fascist states don't make total sense. Fascists aren't rational actors. Humans in general aren't rational actors, but fascism is built expressly on at the ground level on the nuts and bolts individual personal level, not taking rational action blindly. We're encouraging people to blindly accept mutually contradictory statements from the state as truth without attempting to reconcile them. Where fascist states are rational. And I use that term used loosely is that the people who run them are at the very least aware that they are running a machine fueled by human blood to be churned up in the acts of conquest. They seek to accomplish 
through expansion and, well, conquest and subjugation of neighboring countries or neighboring states, neighboring populations. And that's where the book falls down, or the depiction of Navarre in the book falls down, because from what we see in this book, all Navarre's got is dragons and their riders. The dragons are stated to be too valuable to lose. Their birth rate is too low to the point where a dragon's death is a significant setback. And the dragons choose their riders. And indeed, because of how valuable dragons are, the everyone defers to the writer, to the dragons in terms of the writer selection, even if somebody is politically unwanted or um pol- or otherwise in the wrong or in from an outward for a, um, a disgraced group. If a dragon picks that person, they've picked that person. Um, and the dragon, what the dragon says goes. So that said, so that said, you have a finite number of writers that get selected for the finite number of dragons and not just like anyone too. So, What's the rest of your military there? We get fucking all about infantry, horse cavalry, artillery, or any of the other goddamn things that you use to fight a war. Put this in comparison to an to a um, anime and manga which depicts a fascist state. In Attack on Titan, you have more than just the scout corps. You have people on the walls manning artillery, you have aerial units in balloons, you don't just have people zipping around on 3D maneuver gear slicing up uh, titan necks. And in, well, um, M- Mobile Suit Gundam in the Universal Century with Xeon, another fascist state, they have not, they you're not just going around in the mobile armor sending out new types to fight against um the fed the earth federation um they have regular capital ships they have um smaller infantry units uh and they have lots and lots of regular rank and file ordinary zakus there's nothing like that here there is no sense for navarre that there is a rank and file now Again, people aren't rational actors, and character I don't necessarily expect characters in a work of fiction to be rational actors, but the characters are supposed to be perceived by the readers as human beings with their own motivations, and the same applies to the societies they live in, that they are inhabited by human beings with their own motivations. I don't expect them to be run rationally. I don't expect people in these worlds to re- act rationally. I expect their decisions, though, even if they are irrational, to be internally consistent in their irrationality. In a state, there is extor- historical explanation as to why there are why the various ways in which our country, the my country, the United States, um, why what it does and what its ideals are uh, contradict each other, and why and why they aren't internally consistent. Um, same with other countries, with the ways that their ideals and the ways that the, that those countries act in terms of their governments are not internally consistent. When you're doing the first book of a series, when you have this sort of internal inconsistency, you need to take the time to explain why things don't mesh, why the gears are grinding, at least a little bit. I don't need the level of heavy info dump that we got in the Legend of the Galactic Heroes novels when we get to the internal inconsistencies within um, that within the Galactic Empire those those books in that anime does that led because those were actually relatively short books by comparison they're practical novellas and so that's why the the early books are relatively dry because it's shoving so much groundwork in there it doesn't necessarily have a lot of time to manage the two now fourth wing is a larger book and has more time to do this And again, I'm not expecting a full chapter and a half of historical backstory. 
what I am expecting is something of an explanation of the historical groundwork that led to why, that led to why these countries fell up like the justification with between each other as to why these countries fell apart in the past. I want um, some explanation as to why like I actually like I don't even need too much in terms of why the um the historical background of these two countries having been allied is being erased because they're trying to justify the war with each other, but why they're then covering up the return of this threat when you could just as easily just make the response of, well, we don't, uh, well, covering up our past alliance while still keeping the information about this new threat because, or the return of this old threat because, well, it's a th it's been a thousand years since then. We can totally take them on our own now. That sort of thing. Um, we weren't ready then. We're ready now, and we will. And we're stronger than they are. And and so, or that, or even that they have been subverted by this threat when they haven't. In, re in reality, they have that sort of thing. The first book has to do all the levy heavy listing foundation. It has to explain why your rejected, rejected dragon rider candidates aren't shunted to horse cavalry or, cap or scout units, or their artillery, or their regular infantry. That 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 groundwork needs to be laid. The most we get is their backup candidates if another dragon becomes available, combined with the prohibition against the assassination of paired dra dragon riders. Which still, again, makes for something of, of a mess. Once you have enough dragon riders for your dragons to send them out on field missions and training missions and get them ready to, to be out there in the in the wild, um, you have these other people who are just sitting on their butts. Otherwise, why aren't they being sent to infantry? Why aren't they being sent to scout units? Why aren't they being sent to artillery? Why aren't they being sent to other places to do other things for this seemingly vital to every aspect of their society war effort? And this is all combined with a literally last paragraph twist, like last page, very end of the book twist that was going for a reaction that was supposed to be that was trying to get the reader to go, what? Where's the next book? I need an explanation for this. Oh, I need to pre-order it now. That's the re like, that's the reaction they're going for. The reaction I got was because of the failings with everything else in this book, in terms of laying groundwork, in terms of issues with the rest of the setting, my reaction was more, what the fuck? I look, I go into a book wanting to like it. And I like there are parts of this book that I do truly like. I like the characterization here. I like Violet and her inner relationship with her Sundere senpai Zayden. That was great. Um, I like the ways that Violet adapts to her disability for the course of going through Dragon Rider training. And then once she's become a Dragon Rider herself, that's excellent. I like the fact that they introduced that once you're a paired Dragon Rider, that you have stand powers. And that and I, that was cool that one of that violet stand power was star platinum. Like there were things in there that had me hooked and kept me going through the entire book in spite of all these setting issues. But when I hit that last page, I'm going, I went, this book just cut a check that based on the setting issues that I had to be that I had to push aside in favor of the character of the characterization that I did like that I don't think this can pass. It's one thing if it's the book has a somewhat satisfying conclusion with a setup for a sequel with, with the idea that there's more story elements to be picked up in future books. That's one thing. I like the sense that I have a, a somewhat cohesive narrative here, even if I know that the story isn't complete, but can be continued in a future book if I feel so inclined, where I can go away happy and satisfied, but knowing that if there's, but if I want more, there is more. 
Um, to use a caught example of a book I previously reviewed, the first Dragonlance novel, the story is not over. The story is very clearly not over. Takesis and her dragon armies are still out there. They are threatening the world. The world is in peril. But for the moment, our characters are okay. They have a moment to rest. And so we, as the reader, have can take a moment to rest at the end of the book and our denouement so that we can pick up later when the next book is ready. And having this sort of end of a Netflix season, I choose that analogy deliberately, end of a Netflix season cliffhanger where, where theoretically there's another season coming out, maybe, but it's dropping a lot of stuff here that leads me going, I don't know how they're going to pick this up. And I don't, and further, I don't know if they can satisfactorily wrap up everything they've set up here, plus deal with this cliffhanger in the next book. And that's kind of what I took away from. Again, the writing and the char character writing and the character dynamics, like the characters themselves and how they interact with each other is excellent. I loved that. But the world, the larger pic picture that those characters are within, that they inhabit is written in ways that for me holistically harms the story and makes me not want to read the next book. So I can't wholeheartedly recommend fourth wing. I have heard that I've read the announcements that it has been optioned for a Amazon television series. And I want to think that the writers of that series can sit down and go, okay, here's the larger pieces of world building that don't quite work, that stumble and fall. And heart that could cause the work to stumble and fall and can cause aggravations that will make issue, make things not work well for the audience when you put them into the context of an ongoing television series. Let's see what we can do to address that. but I don't know if they will, if they'll be able to. And that's my frustration. And again, to be clear, I'm okay with content with continuity issues and other hiccups, that sort of thing. I'm wearing a Doctor Who shirt. Doctor Who plays fast, plays fast and loose with continuity and has been doing, and has been proudly doing so for almost 50 years. That said, this isn't Doctor Who. Um, there's also part of the reason Doctor Who can do that is that stories in the past, like in the classic era, were all self-contained. And so they could relatively play fast and loose with that because the past is we're, we're only going to reference a previous story if we feel like we need to reference something there. Otherwise, we can just pretend it didn't exist because we didn't have home video. And we so we didn't know that people were going, people would not necessarily be able to back reference it, for example. But this is a book, and this is a book that is meant to be part of an ongoing series with internal continuity with each other. And so I expect you to get, and I'm not expecting the best world building in all the world, I'm not expecting Tolkien, but I am expecting things, I'm expecting the gears to mesh with each other, and that doesn't happen. <laughs>